Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Praise the Lord Jesus. Galatians chapter 6 verse 11. Galatians 6 11, Paul says, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. You see that? 2 Thessalonians 3 17. Galatians 6, 11 says, you've seen how big the handwriting is with my own what? How a large letter I have written unto you with my own hand. 2 Thessalonians 3, 17 says, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I what? I write. He used to write salutations, but he also used to write the biggest part of his letters. But there's a guy who used to help him write. They used to call him Tatius. Tatius. Romans 16, verse 22. The Bible says, I, Tatius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Which epistle? Romans. Okay? So does that mean that he spoke from his own and wrote his own? No, no, no. It only means Paul spoke and Tatius wrote. You understand? Paul spoke and Tatius wrote. There is a reason as to why Tatius wrote. But when you see Tatius writing for Paul, you'll understand why Tatius had to write for Paul. And please note that Tatius used to write for Paul. He wrote for Paul at least in the book of Romans. The rest, like I read for you, Thessalonica, Galatians, some of these things he wrote with his own self, and a salutation. But even in Romans, he writes salutations because he says, I did the salutations in all the letters, but he did not write all the letters. So at the particular point, we had a certain clever guy called Tatius who used to help Paul do what? Inscribe as he spoke. There was a need for coherence or clarity when you're writing particularly the letter to the Romans because that was the most sensitive thing Paul ever wrote regarding the grace and the law. So he needed a language that could go so deep to the Jewish line, to the interpretation, with the hope that he might have to interpret these things by the testimony of two or three witnesses such that he would write the book of Romans in an established experience. Because the Bible tells us that by the testimony of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So in this sense, it's not Titus affirming the spiritual thing on Paul, but it is Titus writing, affirming the translations to the Greek. Hallelujah. So who is Paul? The Bible tells us that Paul was born in Tarsus, and Tarsus is a center in Greece. And... Um, for some of you who have read about Tarsus, you realize Tarsus was as strong probably as Athens, was as strong probably as Alexandria. Those were like the greatest centers. And wherever there was a Greek center, there was the richest culture. So actually Paul was born in the richest culture of the Greek people. Praise the Lord. Let me show you something. Acts 21 verse 39. He says, but Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of, in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. That means the city was not simple. It was a serious city. You understand? It was not a poor city. It was not a mean city. It wasn't small. It wasn't disadvantaged. Tarsus was big. That's why I said I could liken it to Athens. I could liken it to Alexandria. Those were like the biggest centers of the city. And they carry the biggest lines of culture. Thank you very much. Acts 13 verse 9. Give me about from the seventh verse. Uh-huh. The Bible speaks of Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who is called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of the Lord. Eight. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, I also need to note for you that um, Paul was not Greek. You understand? All of us know that. Paul was Jew. You remember in Philippians how he says that I am of the stock of Benjamin of the tribe of Israel? Philippians 3, 5. What does it say? Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. So what does that tell you? That he was not but he was born in Greece. You see that? So, that would mean that the parents of Paul were in Greece, yet they were not Greek. You understand? They were in Greece, but they were not. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So, they were in diaspora. Okay, I just want to give you a picture of a young man who is raised by Jewish parents in a foreign country. And in that foreign country, he is in the richest and one of the most successful Greek cultural centers. So this is a Jew in Greece. You understand? Definitely he understands the Greek language. Definitely the parents have something in Greece. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Praise the Lord. But the Bible tells us he's of the Stock of, of the tribe of Benjamin. Acts 23 verse 6. What does it say? But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, he cried out in the council and said, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. You understand? So what does that add on to you? He's a Jewish man of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, with a Pharisee father in diaspora in Greece, in one of the richest Greek cultures in Greece. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So you're seeing a guy who is also a son of the Pharisees. Now a Pharisee is in diaspora with his own wife and child, and he loves the law of the Lord. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Now I'm going to come back to the line of what makes the Pharisee, who they are. But this is a Pharisee who has a child, are you understanding me? And he's in diaspora. There is a reason as to why the Pharisee left Jerusalem or Israel and came to Greece. Okay? And then he started to have a place among the people of Greece in a center of the richest culture. But his heart is still home. You understand? The father of Paul still has a heart home. What does he do? He starts to raise his child in the way that he should go. Because he knows by the teachings of the forefathers and the other faith, he's very clear, raise up a child in the way that they should go. If they grow up, they will not what? They will not depart. Do we understand where we're coming from? So, he starts to raise his boy. Now the scriptures now tell us, Paul leaves uh, Greece at a particular age. He goes to sit under the feet of one Gamaliel the lawyer. And the Bible tells us that Galamaliel was a doctor of the law. Praise the Lord. He was not just a mere doctor. Acts 22 verse 3. And verily a man, this is Paul says, which I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus, in the city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as you all are this day. You see where I'm coming from? So, Pharisee is raising his child and telling them, even though we are in diaspora, even though we are risen, I need you somewhere the other side. So, he's raising his boy, telling him, there is Greek culture, Greek culture is wonderful, everything about the Greek people is good, but I'm looking for this one intention, that as you start to grow and understand the scriptures, I will take you back to where we come from, because I must raise a Pharisee. He is a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. Okay? He lives Greek culture in Tarsus, crosses through, goes to Jerusalem, sits under the feet of the best doctors of the law. One of the most 
well experienced doctors in the law. You're seeing two things. You're seeing a man who loved God producing a son and makes the son love God enough to leave his coach, his sitting room, the tree he used to sit under, the water he used to drink, the food he used to eat, to go and enter another culture, which is foreign too, at that particular point. We don't know why these two left, you understand? Maybe the father also left in the zeal of being a Pharisee. But the most important thing is the boy is born in the Gentiles. He's a Jew born in the Gentiles. Now you'll make sense why later the same boy is sent to the Gentiles where he was born. I will explain a principle that sets you back to the Gentiles. I'll explain a principle that sends Paul back to the Gentiles. As in by, by default he had to go back. Okay? Why? He was born in the Gentile. He was raised in a certain Gentile way. Even though the father was Pharisees and he observed everything, goes to a lawyer in the Jewish line, there is a thing about Paul that knows the Gentiles very well. Very well. So I'm coming to that. You understand, friend, tell you? Hallelujah. 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 Are we at, up to that level? Now I want to show you something. Acts chapter 6 verse 1. Let's read this story. It says, And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the ministration of? In the ministration of? In the ministration of? Food. Give me the Amplified Bible back. What does it say? Now about this time, when the number of disciples greatly increased, a complaint was made, that's what I was looking for, by the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked and neglected in the daily ministration or distribution. Let's continue the story. And the Bible says, So the twelve apostles convened the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not seemly or desirable, right, that we should have to give up or neglect preaching the word in order to attend the serving at tables and superintending the distribution of food. They select seven men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And then they set them to the distribution of food that they might commit themselves to prayer and fasting. But now I'm introducing to you another line of Jews. There's a line of Jews who are Greek speaking. They are Hellenists. How did they know the Greek language? Simple. They were in diaspora, like Paul. So Paul was a Hellenist Jew. He was not just a traditional Jew, he was a Hellenistic Jew. In his day you'd call him a Grecian Jew. Not just a normal Jew, but a Grecian Jew. A Jew that understands the Greek language and not because he knew Greek but because of a certain culture that had been embedded in him. So Paul had two schools of thoughts in his spirit as he was growing up. He embraced the Hellenistic line because he was raised in diaspora and during that time Israel had a line of submission to Roman rule. You agree? Do you agree? But also number two, he has a line of Judaism. Why? Because he is a Pharisee. So he has a Judistic school of thought and he has a Hellenistic school of thought. Now, what is Hellenism? I want to open your eyes to what is Hellenism. As in, I want to open to you more distinctly. Oh, probably I'll still give you the other Greek line. Philippians 3, 6. The Judistic thing. The Judistic thing. What does it say? Concerning zeal, I was persecuting the church. You understand? Let's begin from five. Mm -mm. Before that, four. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he what, what? He has what? Whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Next line. Give me the amplified. I need the amplified in this because I need to explain a lot. He says, Though for myself I have at least grounds to rely on the flesh, if any other man considers that he has or seems to have reason to rely on the flesh and his physical and outward advantage, he has, I have still more. Next line. He says, circumcised when I was eight days old. Why? Because the father was Stawayaliti, Pharisee, of the rest of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew and the son of Hebrews. As to the observance of the law, I was party of the Pharisees. Next line. As to my zeal, I was persecutor of the church. And by the law standards, righteousness, 
of righteousness, that is supposed justice, uprightness, and right standing with God, I was proven to be blameless, and no fault was found with me. Next slide. Uh -huh. But whatever things that I had and might have been gained to me, I have come to consider as one combined loss for Christ's sake. But it tells you, concerning the laws of my father, as of to be righteous in the law, I was what? Blameless. That means he had a certain line of set rules to obey for Paul to become perfect in a certain line of thought. And that is the Judistic school of thought. It is entirely relying on the law. It's entirely relying on the law. I'll come to that a bit later. But let me go back a bit to the Hellenist. Okay? There was a king they used to call Alexander. Some of you have heard the guy. Alexander, he was a great guy. Huge guy. So he went overtaking and getting quite a vast number of territories under his leadership. But the people that he's taking over are of different groups of people. So there is a heterogeneous line of the people under Alexandria. They are not one voice. They are not one language. They are not one school of thought. They are not one culture. Okay? Now, when Alexandria took over that, he had a teacher called Socrates. Socrates introduced to him a certain school of thought because they used to teach him, okay? He was working with the lines of the Greeks. And you know, you and I know, like Paul tells you, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But the what? The Jews after a sign. You understand? So Paul has the grace of having sat under men who know how to articulate by wisdom without the necessity of the Jewish. Um, if you're talking of a reasoning line, the Greek guys could reason way better than the Jewish would. The Jewish was slightly weaker here. They want to see a sign. But the Greek guy can sit with you down and start to calculate everything to get a more sustainable explanation of everything. These were men with brains, you understand? And if a man has a brain and he can't lack anything but he's smart, ha, that man is too hard to control, you understand? Now Alexandria, in about 336 years BC, to about 323 years BC, that was one of the most dominant lines that Alexandria made the biggest reformations in Greece. And Rome and all the other parts that he had what? Put under his control. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Now for some of you who know that chronological, you know it goes reducing from 300, 200, 1 BC up to Dish and then AD. You get the concept? So when they say 336 to 323, it's growing lower. It's not supposed to be 323 to 333. You, you get the concept? Do you understand? Now, Alexandria has a school guy and he tells him Socrates and all these good teachers around him. They tell him, if we have a vast number of people, all with a different kind of understanding, schools of thought, culture, artifacts, values, norms, belief systems, you understand? Set of rules, affiliations, you know, interpretations, interjections, they have everything. They are two different. You have two different people from a different home and you're forcing them to eat the same food, sleep the same way. You must create a certain middle line for all of them to meet it. You understand? Now, the wisdom of Socrates is, he says, never introduce something. This is the wisdom of the Greek people. They say you should never introduce something with the impression of showing the people to whom you introduce to that it's from above. Or that's from above. They will sign it, they will look for their position, they will look for a place to fight it, they will look for a place to oppose it, and consequently, there will be a vast majority down here trying to fight a smaller line of the bottom up, and easily you can be toppled. So the wisdom of the Greek people is, and I've seen also in modern management, now men are realizing greater methods of management, and they're going back to the oldest wisdom of the Greek people. Sell the idea to the people, let them buy it, use them to sell it to the others. As they do that to sell it to the others, there will be a lesser resistance because their own kind is introducing it, not the guy from above. Their own kind is introducing it. As their own kind continues to introduce it, 
and then they get in and in and in and in and in. You will have the biggest number of vast majority. They will have a small line of people who have refused. Those particular small numbers of people who have refused, you can open war on them. By fear of being on the wrong side, but not only wrong, but disadvantaged, many of them will either flee or seek to reconcile with a bigger vast majority. And now what do you do? You have everything implemented, not as your idea, but as the idea of people. You get it. But at the end of the day, the big man sat somewhere up there in a certain office without you and then says, I want to do this. How can I do it? He gets his guys down. Same things political guys do. You understand? He says, I want this to be done. Okay, what should I do? We want this to be initiated. Okay? How much money do we need to do this? We need about $3 million. Okay? How are we going to distribute the $3 million? Let us distribute them in the districts, the provinces, corporate wires, the formal sector, informal sector, private people, the institutions, the schools, and all these kinds of things. So I have a church, and I have somebody I can use in the churches to pass this message. I have a school, and I have somebody I can use in the schools to pass this message. So in the time when the teachers are not raised in salary, there is a certain muingo who comes in and tells them, wait. You see the idea? So he, because you have tried it from above, and you're forcing them to a certain line where they'll say, ah, no, this is too much. We have been teaching and teaching. What do you do? Get a fellow teacher who has taught for many years. Let him stand on television and say, Tulindeko, Tulindeko, I'm part of you, you guys. But we're not, we're, let's wait. You understand? And from now on, there's a silence. Because it works. Like magic. Like magic. It works. You understand? That is why the new latest methods of management. More so if you're working with more sensitive lines of management, like repositioning. How many of you would ever have an idea about repositioning of companies or businesses? Branding is, is part of repositioning. How many of you? Banagi, Agatha Hamba, repositioning. Where a company, for example, has been living a certain pattern, okay? And then as you get now to work with people who are, who are technical, eh? if you're using people who are technical, you might look at a company and say, for example, at the end of there, we look at the balance sheet, income statements, okay? And then we look at the bottom line and realize that this business made $5 million last year. And then when we look at this business having $5 million last year, we look at their capital base, the capital they've used to get $5 million, you understand? We look at the debt income ratio, if the company is indebted anywhere. We look at the the number of resources that they have, we make a SWOT analysis of it, strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats. You know, we look at the history. How established is this company, okay? How many people does it have? What's its strength? Does it have presence, okay? How many branches does this business have? It has 200 branches. And out of the 200 branches, they made a profit of $5 million. Then there's a smaller company, okay, that is almost 50% less than this one, and the same company has made five million dollars. So the consequence is, if with all these numbers of people we've made five million dollars, and something half us has made five million dollars, it means if we do the right thing, we could have actually made ten million dollars. We have had a certain revenue leakage somewhere. Our revenue leaked somewhere. There was a mistake somewhere. Maybe these guys are good at collecting commissions, you understand, off balance sheet. Things that are off balance, they don't necessarily include the direct expenses of that company, you understand, but they can earn off it. Seltel, for example, can say, we've run onto a mobile body business, okay? You understand what I'm trying to tell you? But I'll tell you the truth, even though Seltel earns off this, they don't do much. Because this is not money moving by Seltel bullion van. This is agents who have bought an opportunity, and what are they doing? They are the ones who are buying float from the company. They're the ones who are having all the risks, okay? Seltel is averted and separated from the risk. For them, what they're putting is a platform between the guy who takes a high risk, the other side, and the guy who takes a risk, this side, and they're earning money in the middle here because they've given you platform. But also Seltel has someone who gives them a platform. <laughs> you get what I'm trying to tell you? So they pay this guy, but this guy also can't enter the lines of Celtel because he will need another line of infrastructure which would kill his picture 
for giving platform to other people. Are we together with the Zen? You'll understand. I'm trying to explain to you something. I want to explain a certain thing to you so that you understand clearly. So, what do you do? You realize probably we've been, you know, probably Celtel had three, two extra products on uh, Airtel money and we didn't have Airtel money. How do we get Airtel money? We realize even the structures that we have cannot give us Airtel money. But if we go now deeper to the line, we realize we can't even adopt Airtel money because maybe the provisions for us to adopt an, uh, an Airtel money business to add on to it for us to make more, price, more products is not as simple as Airtel did it because for them they are in a better management position than we are. What do we do? We reposition. But there's a third party who could have easily said, oh, product. They also bring it on board. Those are not just strictly positioning. No, no, no. Those are just adopting and mutating. That's adaptation, mutation. Oh, they have this product. Do we have the machinery to do that? Yes. Do we have the technical staff to do that? Back end and front office? Yes. They bring it on. But there are companies that would take years to do that. Or it would take a very big expense for them. It would take a very longer route. Or probably even the line of how it could have worked was there. But there was no way it could be done because of the method of everything that is done. Okay, if you try it, it just becomes a disaster. What do you do? Reposition the company. Place it in a position where it can compete with the others favorably. Branding is part of it. Changing a lot of things is part of it. You know, firing and hiring new staff, restructuring the order of the company. Sometimes when you're inside there, you realize that some of the staff who are there are not necessarily supposed to be there. You downsize the company, you understand? You realize that one guy could have actually done two things. You hire him and add him just half the money. You've been paying the full amount of the other one, then you fire this one. What are you trying to do? You're trying to put your company in a more breathing space for it to pick such that the next year you can make $10 million while the other small guy makes five. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for a small guy to make $5 million, and I'm also making $5 million, and yet I'm way bigger than him. You understand where I'm coming from? When you're doing that kind of line, okay, even to the hardest places, even with men who understand management, they don't bring it and say, now we're going to reposition your, your company. Firstly, bring the company structures. Who is this? MD? Mm -mm. Yeah. CEO, translated. Who is this? Head of what? Mm -mm. Cancel him. Get him out. Who is this? No, no, no. Get him out. No. Who is this? Ah, get him out. No, no, no. They don't do that. They start to sell the idea inside you. They first bring, <laughs> they have a, a right line of first bringing those people in a, they first take them out to a, what do they call them? Retreat. If it's not a, retreat, a planning retreat for next year's. What do you think is wrong with the company? You start to give your answers. It doesn't mean they don't know. They just want to involve you, such that you know we worked as a team <laughs> and came to a conclusion that this was they already need they know. <laughs> you really think they don't? Do you really think they don't? You look at that primary teacher who asks the question, you think he doesn't know? You get what I'm trying to tell you. So what do you think is wrong? They even start to snake themselves. You see, some of us he doesn't even give the name. Noted. Okay, they do the retreat, start to prepare their hearts to embrace change. <laughs> you understand? It? Change management, <laughs> crisis management, <laughs> other retirement packages. You see, they, right? they prepare their hearts, some of them who are going to leave there, the business. You understand? But in the end of the day, the downsides do everything, but the company has to get to a breathing place because we need to make more money. And it was more than just putting one product on board. It needed an overhauling of the whole business. You understand what I'm saying? But what did they do? They went down to the ground, discussed with you, involved each one of you, such that by the time they are almost firing, you know who is going. You move on money, you understand? They pay off their benefits and then they go happily because they're involved. It could have been another thing if they just woke up and said, 
In two months, you should have left here. Uh, we shall give you a retirement package. Thank you very much. Please advertise. They're advertising your role while you're still working. Okay? So, Alexander had the same idea. Alexander says, the teacher tells him, you know, don't put it on them like it is from up. Let us start to dig it from down here. Okay? And how are we going to have a certain overhaul? Because what we're looking for is a line of nationalism, one, to get these groups to all start thinking in a certain way. Because if you don't get these groups thinking in a certain way, you will not have order in these groups. Okay? You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So we need to address things that go down to the roots of these people. What was the land, number one thing they adopted? Language. Right, language. So they get a kind of line where the language that is spoken is, now he's saying, let us ban all these other languages that are spoken. Let us all speak Greek. Whether you're a Jew, speak Greek. Whether you're from America, whether from your, you, wherever you're coming from, he's telling them, speak what? Greek. What he's intending to do here is, he wants all of you to have a common line of communication. You understand? What does he do? He gets the Old Testament. As is in the Greek, he hires 70 men, puts them on an island, starts to make them interpret every word per word from the Hebrew to the Greek language. What is he looking for? He wants to get the Septuagint. Some of you have heard of a certain word called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a book that has translated the whole Old Testament to Greek. So that the Greek people can understand. But number two, if Christians are coming on board because they come with their GD stick school of thought and they are still under your rule, let them be Christian, but let them pray in a language you understand. Let their children read from the language you understand. Because if they read from the language you understand, it's very easy for you to inculcate them in your culture. Because there are certain things that won't make sense except if they are explained in your language. Many people know love according to the Greek line. Agape, Phileo, Philadelphia, you understand? Philos. They know the love according to the Greek. Many people don't know love according to the Jew. If you don't understand love to the people he loved, you might have a, a very diluted understanding of love. You understand? That's why I got the four facets of love describe them from the Hebrew people. Why? Because these were his choice people. This, this was an affair between God and the Jews. If you understand how the Jews describe love, you realize it is way richer than the Greeks do. Way richer than the Greeks do. You realize it's way richer than the Greeks understand it. You see that? But if you listen to that CD of love from the Greeks, and let me tell you what happened. I was in the morning, and the Lord tells me, I want to teach you love, and I want you to teach the church love, okay? And I'm thinking, okay, wonderful, I already know agape, I already know phileo, I know these things. So I'm just going to go write notes about them and teach. And while I'm going to the bathroom, the Spirit of the Lord asks me, how can you teach love from a people who are not first choice? From the perspective of people who are using a language and they were not first choice. This was the Spirit speaking. I asked him, I had never thought about that. And then I went on internet and stuff and realized the biggest number, in fact, almost all the material I found was Greek definitions of love. I said, but how come I've never really read where men have actually described love from the people God loves, from the people God had a relationship with. So that caught me. I said, okay, God, teach me. I went to study and everything. I was amazed when I met love there. I was amazed when I met love there. Because it goes deeper. That's why I gave some of you the example of Hosea. Which kind of love can buy a prostitute? The Greek can't define it. Which kind of love can go on the street and buy a prostitute? And then she comes in your house and then cooks for three times, produces three kids, and then goes back to prostitution. And that love goes back deeper. And then he tells Hosea, as for is a relationship with you and Goma, so is with me and my people of Israel. Not the Greek people. This is him and the people of Israel. It is way deeper, deeper understanding of love. This is God trying to express his relationship with the, for the Jewish, not the Greek. You see what I'm trying to tell you? So the Greek can try to define love, but he will never understand the relationship. That's why I preach from that. 
Hebrew perspective. Get that CD. It's wonderful. It's very wonderful. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, you deal with the language. Okay? Now, if they can all believe, if they can all be aligned to the language you're speaking, during that time in Alexander Day, they had what you might call the lingua franca, okay? From the old word of the general language used, okay? General language used. So, if the Greek should worship my God, he will worship him in Greek. But if the Jew should bring his God, let him explain his God to us. The Greek way. You understand? And because there's a place of reasoning. That's why when they get later to the lines of religion, which I'm about to get into in a while, the Greek interpret God differently. The Greek come up with a thought that um, it's the same God who just has different names. Yes, it's true. They just say. They say it's the same God, but it just has different names. So they say, to us, like our God to the Greek is Zeus, when we go to the Romans, we find Jupiter. Jupiter and Zeus are the same. There's no difference. So that kind of school of thought forms in the hearts of men to think, you can be Catholic, you can be Protestant, you can be Muslim, but we have the same. You, you use the Lozare. Me, I don't use the Lozare. You, you use the Mutarabusi. You, you face a black box. Me, I don't. But we have the same. But there is, there is, is the biggest influence of pagan worship. So some of you, if, you, if I continue explaining this, you realize that there was a very big influence where Judaism influences Hellenism, Hellenism influences Judaism. They were married for so long. They used to just exchange everything married people exchange with. Because Hellenism and Jews, Judaism influences Hellenism in a certain way, and Hellenism influences Judaism in a certain way. But what is the underlying school of thought? It is the same God. Okay? Let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you the truth. And I'm sorry this is going to be a hard paper, but it's the truth. I tell you, the Roman Catholic does not pray the same God with a born again Christian. Right now, there is somebody have disoriented. Why? Because he has been raised in that institution. He works after the pattern of the Greek. There is nothing about it. For example, very clearly, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody gets to the Father except by me. If another school of thought says it can use Mary, it is not using my Bible. It is not using... Listen, you have to get to a point. Let me tell you, there are compromises in the gospel that are healthy. But there are compromises that get to a certain end of it and you say, no, this is too much. Or you know who kills and say, we can compromise to this level, but this is too much. You understand? It's like the people who say homosexuals have to be loved. It's true. We love homosexuals. Okay? Some of us have loved them out of it. We have loved them out of it. Right in this room, there are men and women who are homosexual, and we prayed with them, and they walked out of it. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? But it's another thing to love them, to spoil them. That goes deeper. Because that is not love. It's another thing. You get what I'm trying to tell you? I can't say, I'm going to provide for you, because I've been... Like when I was in Asia, I found a church, a Methodist church, that was paying for people to have sex change. A Methodist church, Christian church, that was paying for Chinese people to have a sex change. If you're tired of being a woman, they give you money, you go to the best operation there is, you come back a man. If you're tired of being a man, you go to the best operation there is, you come back a woman. This is a church giving money. That is too much. That's gone too far. This is not love now. This is not love now. You understand? Although, I'm not going to get a man and say he's gang stoning. That's also stupid. You understand? As though homosexual is different from lying. It's all sin. Okay? If you're saying it's sin, classify it all as you understand what I'm telling you? Hang everyone also. But we also have limits. Here it is too much. You can't go in high school and start to recruit little boys to make them think they are what they are not. Oh God, we pray for our president. We pray for our people. We pray for our nation. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. But we have a place where a man can say, I have this weakness. We get the guy, pray with him, get him out. He gets married. We move on. But we also say no. You understand? I cannot say, I can say, Hail Mary, pray for me. The Bible says clearly, he is the way. But is his mother? Yes. The mother is there. But he says he is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the father. Except, but he's a mother. Yes. I understand that bit of the mother. Let you know to come The Bible says he is the way, the truth, and the life. Period. Blessed are you among the mothers. Oh no, I'm not blessed. Blessed is everyone who believes. This is Mary herself telling you. You're more blessed to believe. Because when you believe, I also get in the sheepfold of believing. In the dispensation of the miraculous and the anointing, she's no longer a mother. She's a woman. Woman, what does thou want us with me? No, it's not. It's not yet my time to perform miracles. We're speaking spiritual matters here. Not mother, son. <laughs> Clear cut. But, this school of thought has men believe, made men believe we have the same God. When I went to Malaysia, Kuching, there was a very big debate. Very big debate. Where Muslims were debating against Christians. And this is the irony. Some Christians have still maintained the name Allah. Yes, it's true. Go to Malaysia. A Christian and they're maintaining the name Allah. And the Muslims are telling them, don't use our name if you are not in a mosque. Debate started. There is a group wanting to... <laughs> it is fighting for a name the owners don't want to possess. <laughs> and if you sit down with these men and reason, you realize they have a wisdom of the Greek. They can reason you out very well. Perfect. They also have their line of thought. They have a way where they come from the Allah line and explain it to a certain root. And they have also a way they can explain Yahweh and make it funny. You understand? But that was the quotation. How can a church Christian get to a point where he's fighting to call his God Allah? Because to him he thinks it's the universal name for God. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. Read the Quran, you'll understand. May I read? He cannot be. If I read them in the Quran, I don't care whether you call him Allah, he just can't be. God can't be certain things. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So this is deeper than language. Okay? Now the Muslim agenda also knows the secret. That's why they intend that everyone using Islam should use Arabic. They know if you change it in another way, you'll kill their concept. Even people who don't know, they just speak Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Ma'alik, You know those things. They don't even know what they're saying. They don't even know what they're saying. Some people don't even know the meaning of what they're saying. Subhanallah. <laughs> what is Subhanallah? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So the concept is, if you have a language, you will keep the people. If you have a language, you will keep. So the Hellenists maintain a language and say, general language to be used, Greek. New Testament translated in Greek. Whether it was who, whether it was who, translated in Greek. If you want a story on Jesus, give it to us in the Greek version. Don't give him to us in the Hebrew. He spoke Hebrew, we know. He spoke a bit of Aramaic, we understand. The Bible tells you, for example, in the book of Acts. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Acts 26 verse 14. What does it say? And when we are all fallen to the earth, this is Paul at conversion. He says, a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew language. Do you realize that when Jesus changed language, 
in many instances, they quoted him changing in the Gospels. Do you remember? Lama Lamai, Sabachthani, you understand? Talitha Kumai. He spoke in the Aramaic language. Every time he spoke in another language to keep revelation and the substance. For example, one time I explained to you Talitha Kumai. How many of you are here? But I explained Talitha Kumai. And I said, if you're speaking it from probably a Hebrew line, or Aramaic, sorry, it could say, little girl, get up. But what is Talitha, little girl, in another language is actually <laughs> the Talith. The Talith is the cloth that they used to use to cover themselves to the Hebrew, okay? In Aramaic, it's little girl, get up. In Aramaic, it's little girl, get up. But in the Hebrew, Talith, uh, or Talith comes from the cloth they used to cover themselves when they were praying, and it used to hide fringes, and those fringes were scriptures. You understand? It was a cloth with fringes of the word of God. It used to have scriptures on its corner. So they used to get this talit and then put it on their heads and then use it for prayer. So this is the talit of the word. So what is little girl rise up or wake up in the Hebrew is actually child in the word. Right. One wrapped in the word. Right. One wrapped in the word. Right. There is more revelation to a man understanding what it means to be wrapped in the word to raise you up. I can get a someone there to actually explain to you that it doesn't matter how much you die, die wrapped in the word. So I start to explain how men used to use the talit and as I explain the meaning of the talit, I actually explain to you the exact meaning of what it means to abide in him. And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Whatsoever you shall ask, it shall be given. You'll understand why, even though he's spoken it in the Aramic word, in the revelation of the Hebrew, he's trying to teach us how to use the word to get results, or how to not get threatened if we are wrapped in the word, regardless of any situation. He teaches us how to abide in him, and he's like abiding in us to a point where we have free access and the liberty and freedom of answered prayer. Men no longer go in the presence of God, believing God and hoping that they'll get answers. They go in the presence of God, sure that they have answers. Because he finds this kid. To him, it is the wrapping of the word that raises the man. It's not the little girl being raised. But if it was not translated and it stayed in a certain way, you might have not gotten the meaning or the revelation. So in this instance, Acts 26 in the same way, I expected, the Bible says, when we were all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew language, la cla, pechli, chli, 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 chli. but that wasn't copied. Alexandria wants it in. We missed something. We missed something. You might not understand this, but we did. I wanted Paul to write it the same way he had it. Maybe we should have had a certain line to convert men. We should have probably have known what blinded him. Maybe we could have read some more Hebrew and understood finally why Paul was blinded. But we didn't have that opportunity. Right? Alexander wants everything translated in the Greek language. He says, speaking to me and to, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why dost thou but accuse this to me? I wanted to hear that in Hebrew. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. This is all spoken in <laughs> Hebrew. Next slide. And I said, who art thou, my Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou art. All of this is it's a conversation of Hebrew. I wanted the Hebrew. I wanted to go to the, to, the, to, the, <laughs> to, the, to the interlinear Bible and dig it myself. And it's in the cadence. And then it's in the cadence. I just wanted him to leave it crude as it was. Let it for me. Me, I will study and go. The beauty goes. Thank God for his word, peace, study, Bible, power, Bible. We can now go inside and look for the meaning of these words. And probably we could have had a deeper sermon of winning souls. The soulish kind, the soul kind. But we never had that opportunity. Why? 
because the language is one. The other concept also Alexander adopted was called cosmopolitanism. Socrates already spoke that line. Socrates had the thought that cosmopolitanism, cosmo, cosmopolitanism. Socrates, it was a school of thought that we are all one people. He would say, I am the world. Okay, I am the world. But it's killing the substance of why God in the first instance says, even though you're all saying that you're the world, America you say you're the world, Uganda you saying you're the world, Iraq you saying you're the world, let us first shut down. I have appointed every man their own timing and their boundaries of habitation. He says he made of all men nations from one blood. There's a reason as to why the bloods are many, but he chooses to make every man a nation. There's a reason as to why you were born in Uganda. This whole concept of trying to bring Western, Asian, European cultures is what is actually bringing all these contentions you see. We, it's wonderful for us to have a global village, but you get the picture of us having a global village, but killing the reason as to why he made one blood of all nations and appointed you, your own timing and your boundaries of habitation. He intended that you live in Uganda. If God has called you to Las Vegas, go to Las Vegas. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. Do you get where I'm coming from? Do you understand where I'm coming from? But the point is still, and I'll still tell you, God has intended. That's why always, and I'll tell you the truth, it doesn't matter how great a deal is, Always seek the voice of God if you're living where God has called you or if you're living where you were born. Never just move because there's a chair in Canada or Australia or you. Listen, if it was that, some of us would be out of this country long ago, long ago. Because we have the anointing, we have the professionalism, we have the magazine, and we have the contact. But there is something that takes a man out and then brings him back home. There is something that tells a man to say, okay, I think I have access to living. The other day some kid called me, pray for me, I'm about to pray in the why They denied me a visa. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I asked her, darling, how old are you? I said, I'm 18. They denied me. Apostle, I don't know whether you can find me here. I said, Grace. I said, I'm going to Mbuge mama, nkusanga, weba kumide visa, nkoleti, kukansoli inge, nki mama, sorry, bambi bamuwe. <laughs> Call me sadist. You remember where he was born? Tassas. You drank Tassas' water. You ate Tassas' food. You slept on Tassas' ground. In fact, you learned to make tents in Tarsus. You crossed to Jerusalem with the ability to make tents that fed you. You owe Tarsus something. Even normal corporations call it corporate social responsibility. Pay back to the community you were raised. Some of you, the moment you left Gulu, that's it. You'll never go back to Gulu. I swear. Can't go back to Gulu. Do anything. You roll anything you want. Send Juju. I, I don't care. I'm not going back to Gulu. There's a pastor I know. Yagamba na verbu koma nsimbi. Siri dabu koma nsimbi. Najira kumoro kayambisi. Na ino sapatu nga tebu fanana. Mwami sodo biyari antu miyabuto. Nena bemoro kegende kampala wale mtu wale mbise kampala kujita. Nenga amba sifira. Oh no. Nelinye moro ka. Siri dabu koma nsimbi. Siri dabu koma nsimbi. Siri dabu koma nsimbi. Listen. Blessed are you in the city. Blessed are you in the country. Go to bukoma nsimbi. God will bless you there. Era kid gumi zlaka I wasn't born there. I'll go back home. Mshali wa nukwa nazari wa u Zambia. Era when I started preaching, nini zira u Zambia nini benjuri for like kaya nini yokan kubaka wem. Many people don't actually know because I, you owe everywhere you are raised something. Oh, you owe them. If you are raised in Muyenga, what is take a walk up and go? Gaiwa nukuzu kizaba fu. Oyu miranga o kumachabu ot. Gaiwa nukuzu kizaba fu. But you are formulate power. Give something back. I preached in Rwanda, Zambia. There's a mere fact that I was born in Zambia to Chairman. 
Kawembe, 1992, up to the time I left, we gave it something. You see, you guys, you, you know. You, you, you know, don't tell them. Always leave something from where you raised. If you drank its water, reward it. Let it boast of you. Let it say, ah, I'm glad I... Some of you... But I is ashamed doing it. Looks at you. You don't look like you. You raised in Barara. God has called you in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> That's why some of these guys, when they come back, they come back with only colognes and long coats. Nothing. No substance. God is gonna bless you. God is. Gonna I tell you, God is not, then the guy takes you around, he has not spoken any mystery. They're empty, they don't have anything. Trust me, you want to look at some of the brothers who went abroad. I'm not saying it's wrong or that God doesn't send there. But there are certain men who say that God has sent them. And then you realize he called them there to teach them. Los Angeles, Nano, Nech, Kumin, Chibura, and Jaranemuru, Manaka, and Nathan Kokurongo, Samatala, Gaba Saja, where Rongo Samatai, Kukubanafuna, Karimu, Musupa Market, Naranko Gavangari, Yom Saja, the Amusangra, the Badanka Community Fellowship, Nario Kapuko Musumba. Grace, I'm not going to first clean a man's toilet and a man's supermarket to preach. I will go a preacher. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? Because I am an apostle there. When I entered Hong Kong, I didn't know any pastor. I didn't have an official invitation. No. No pastor. I entered there. One thing. Some pastor the whole night at midnight is looking for some man called Apostle Grace. His wife told him he's anointed. He enters my room at midnight and said, I have to bless you. Because I was sent there. After that, the man told me, you've done what took me five months to do. In one month. You have done it in three weeks. What took me five months to do? If you took it, you just did it in three weeks. You're blessed. Of course I am. What do you expect? And that's who you are. The moment you get there, you will get to a professional job. You will get a professional opportunity. You will, listen, you're not going to clean a white. Oh, parandala. I cancel that in the name of Jesus. And if you go with that intention, I pray by my God. Be bounced back and brought back to Uganda by the power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. 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 If you go with that attitude, I pray to God you'll be deported and quicker than expected. And you come back. Then you go the right way. Sent of the Lord. I said, Sent of the Lord. If you're a professional here, you're a professional in the United States. If you're an opportunity here, you have opportunity in Australia. If you're blessed in Uganda, you're blessed in Canada. If you're a king in Uganda, you're a king in Canada. Period. King shall come to your rising. That is your testimony. We don't go begging. We go like kings. We enter their wise. We enter there more anointed. We enter there stronger. We help them. After helping them, we come back. And after coming back, they come to visit who helped them. One time a man told me, Man of God, can I give you some advice? I told him, yes. You know, when you're traveling to nations like that, you know, you're going to USA or, you know, London or UK, Go with some lack of vision, you know. Just, just don't go like a man can just, a man can, a man can ask you and say, what do you want to do? What's your vision? He's just, you're just going to stand there and, and, and do nothing. No, don't do nothing. Go with a vision. Tell them what you want to do. Because you see, those men have money. I looked at this man. I said, oh, thank you for the advice. But in my head, I'm thinking, does this think I'm broke? Does this think I am broke? I don't need their money. No, they need my anointing. This one, it's not pride. It's the truth. Everywhere he went, he went about doing good and healing all of them that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. He didn't go begging and explaining visions and the project. No. Let him come to Uganda and see the project and be led. I've seen men 
who are taking their financial board purchases on the internet to show white people how bad they are for their day. For adventure. No. Listen. Get delivered from men. Even if I died and have not stepped in America, I would still stay anointed and I would make my story. Whether you want it or not. Jesus never stepped in the United States. <laughs> Be delivered from men! <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Cosmopolitanism, the idea that you're all a cosmos, you're all the world. And he would kill the principle of what it is for people to have nation and a culture and a value system. What does that mean? Incorporate everything from their norms to the beliefs, to the value systems, to the artifacts. Let them adopt. Let the Greek culture be the most dominant in any adoption. Can you sell this idea to the people? And that's what the Socrates are doing. Then after that, they started to improve their literature. They write a lot. That's the third thing they used to use. Okay, to promote the whole idea of Hellenism. They use a lot of literature. A lot of literature. They would write literatures in science, literatures in everything. But what are they looking for? To expand the idea. Such that if you're using with the literatures, you can attract the arts. You can attract the theater guys. The man is not watching the play in Hebrew. He's watching the play in Greek. He's not watching the man fighting a lion speaking Hebrew. He's watching the guy, the commentator, the gladiators speaking Greek. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? The soldiers that are marching are all dressed in Roman regalia. They can't dress anything else because we need them to understand. The other thing they also used so much was science. Because science used to place a line of reason for many things that were supernatural. And that is why from then on we have always understood the Greek people to be some of the most successful people when it comes to science. Eclipse mathematics lines, the Ptolemaic biocentric lines of, of the earth and how they studied geography and how it works through the world to go, Archimedes principles, all those things, Eureka, it's all Greek. But what are they looking for? They want you to embrace as far as they've gone. You study what they know about the world. Don't invent for them to read from you because you'll switch ranks. They want you to study what they know. Begin from there. You understand? The most successful country in science is usually the strongest country in the world. Many a time. That's why the gun was made by a doctor, a scientist. Not a normal guy. He was a doctor. You get what I'm trying to tell you? So the man is in the library, but the highest level of science is actually having a funding of billions of dollars to make the most toxic thing in the earth. Something you can drop in seconds here and all of us die. But there's a brain making it. Why is it making something that can kill people? With a pretext that, no, it will be under control. It won't kill you, but we need it anyway. For who? For lions? For lions, you tell me. These secondary things you're making, Simanya sensitive alarm systems, the electronic ability, do you make them for snakes? Human beings. One by one to Bazibu. <laughs> People don't build fences for lions. No. You. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. So, science also comes in. The field of mathematics take line. The fields of reasoning take line. Then the lines of religion come in. And the, the line of religion is, it doesn't matter how far men can go, let it be controlled by the state. What should you do? Give power to them that pay allegiance to the state as far as they pay their allegiance in their schools of thought. It doesn't matter. You have your lines of prayer and everything, but I don't care whichever way you go, still submit your lines and affiliation or create a line where it doesn't matter how radical you are as Christians. Don't get too radical. Don't get too radical to a point where we can't explain to you something as a nation and you can't do it. Because we'll create a place which is not nationalistic in the first instance, but number two, we'll have a people who cannot listen to us. What do we do? Can we create institutions? It's very simple. 
How long did it take the Born Again Federation to earn a place in the heart of the president to say, now we recognize you as a people? While the Anglican people were already recognized, while the Protestant people, the Roman Catholic people, the other lines of faith, the Muslim, there's a the line of institution. And the institution should determine, do you have a certain mode of line that agrees with us? If it does, wonderful. As a state, we'll support you. So it's not bad to be subject to the state. They are our leaders. We pray for them. All leadership comes from God. But even the church has a certain place where it can say, nation, you've pushed us this far. I think as Christians, we can't do this. For example, a nation can't say tomorrow and say, if you want to pray, you can only pray. You understand? As Roman Catholic, Protestant, and we're local in one room. If you don't pray that, we don't pray. That's too much. You see where I'm coming from? So what does the state do? The state also starts to be fair to us. That's why our president has said, have freedom of worship. He has given you the right to pray. We are humble to pay respect to our nation and the leaders that the Lord has said before us. So, again, as true Christians of our nation, we must obey every law that is laid to the later. You see the wisdom there. So I'm not going to break the rules because these are my leaders, the Lord has said them. But if my leaders get out of the Lord and put something on me that is not in the Lord, then there's a bigger issue. You understand? They are my leaders. I respect that. But it says, parents, children, obey your parents in the Lord, not outside the Lord. Your father is not going to say, because I'm your father, sleep with that man because I'm your father. Hey, hey, that's far. You understand where I'm coming from? You're my father. I'll wash your shoes. I'll clean your dog. Say anything. Tell me, jump, I'll jump how high, but you're not going to make me marry a man I don't want to marry. That is too far. So there are extremes. So it also calls for a place of understanding from our leaders to understand how far they can push us without respecting our faith. So now the man, Alexander, has a mind and says, okay, I think I need to put these guys in order. That's the thing I always tell people. Every king must surround himself with wise men. Plato, Socrates, Theodis, Aristotle. All of these guys are very, very smart guys. Because any man who understands you have a kingly anointing, don't hang around dense people. Okay, if you have not yet understood that you are a king and priest to the Most High God, hang around with anything. But the moment you understand that you have a kingly anointing upon you, start to relate with people who are wise. That guy who you think has too much, take that one for lunch. Don't take dense people who are weak. Amen. Kampala, yesterday it was hot. No, no, don't hang around with those people. No. <laughs> hang around men who can explain weather forecasts. Who can explain the concepts of the winds, how the winds... Hang around someone who knows. At least, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if the language is given, the literature is given, the religion is changed, philosophies are changed, because now the lines are philosophical. Men start to reason philosophy in the place of religion. Philosophy is just this simple definition of philosophy. The substitute for men who are not ready to go under religion. Philosophy. They reason out every affair and aspect of life. Every affair and aspect of life. Every affair and aspect of life. Some months ago, a guy was writing and he was saying for him he's atheist. So he started to to debate his atheistic points of view. I went his way. You know, some people think we only know the Bible. I went his way. I said to go in his own atheistic schools of thought. Thumped them. He left the wall. I attacked him after the wall. At the end, I said, Ah, oh, man, you've run away, but I'm still following you. What's up? <laughs> Let's reason this thing out. You understand? Now, if you have to be effective, trust me, have the signs and wisdom. Have a message for the Greek and have a message for the Hebrew. Tomorrow I'll start with Judaism. The lines of Hellenism were simple. I want to conclude with this. If there's a Christianity that has to come into the mix, are you hearing me? Of a vast culture of the Greek, it must get a few pagan things inside it and a few pagan systems inside it. I'll give you an example. I'll give you a very clear example. Do you know that philosophy guys are very moral people? Very moral people. 
very moral people. In fact, the underlying definition of the <laughs> meaning of the word Hellenism, from the word Helen, it means one who has acted out of what they've thought. Now it's wonderful for you to say, wow, I thought this so I acted. That's wonderful. But do you realize it disqualifies God's working in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure? Because for it, it just wants you to think and do. But what are those places where you can't think? You get my idea. So, when you get to places where we know not what to pray, huh? the Bible says now a certain sad guy comes in. He speaks in understanding and language we cannot understand. For he speaks mysteries to the most high God. That is not philosophically right, to speak a language you don't understand. For philosophy would teach you, you think, therefore you act. So the farthest line of your thought are your actions and consequently your highest lines of moral. And it's working very well for a man under the law. So they can incorporate and say, okay, it's true, you guys are Ten Commandments, but don't you see that our philosophical view also incalculates that Ten Commandments? You're saying philosophy, don't steal. Philosophically, it's not right to steal. You're saying don't commit murder. I have a certain line of thought that can actually tell you not to commit murder without necessarily the Ten Commandments. So can we make peace here? We're all believing for the same thing. We're fighting for the same thing. Yes, we submit under a certain line. But in the long run, is I have a certain pagan line behind me and I'm trying to put it in you. So, something happens. And that is why when I'm explaining the Judaism line, you'll understand now why the sects come in. Sects. Why there is a Pharisee, <laughs> why there is a Sadducee, why there is a C.E. Anisens. And you ask yourself, one of them says, me, I believe in the Ten Commandments, but I don't believe in the oral law. The oral law, I don't believe. Sadducees, for them, only what is written by God. You understand? And they are all legal guys. Speak in other tongues. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. Mighty warrior, strong in battle, Jehovah is your name. Say God will love you. God teach us. God change us. God speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero, make manifest.